Hey there everyone, 622 AM Eastern Standard Time, 717, 19 I guess. I'm going to continue this time with what I started last time, but it is my hope that I can actually conclude the matter of Meriwether Lewis pretty quickly, only because I think... Uh, some of the material that I mentioned in the book by um, Laffrey is pretty interesting. And I am hoping to get to some of that only because, as I said last time, it's, it is a very interesting read, not only because of the material he covers from the mid-90s, but his conclusions that he came to afterwards. Uh, maybe this could be sort of a segue um, from this series based on Schrag to uh, some of this material uh, by Laffrey. And who knows where it'll go to from there, but I am hoping that this may conclude this series for now. It This subject will again come up because of the continuing studies I have. So there's no worry about that at all. But, you know, all of these things historically, they... They all tie together, you know. There are, uh, there's every reason to believe that uh, unification theories are are not just possible but uh, inevitable. And because of that, I do feel a bit conspicuous, since everything does relate to everything. I think maybe it's a mistake to to uh, to view everything in a sort of schismatic uh, understanding. I think it's, it, it's a lot more, uh, I don't want to say intelligent. Um, I think it will help us make sense of, of really everything uh, that's happened down through history currently um worldwide and and locally um religiously scientifically uh i think there's more to be said about unification than disunification so part of you know where i left off last time was lewis had uh gotten to Griner's uh, Inn, and, and then the next morning, his body is found with, with multiple stab wounds, two gunshots, and apparently it's being ruled from the start as suicide. Now, there's so... <laughs> People have spent an inordinate, inordinate amount of time discussing this. I'm not saying it's a waste of time. Um, an author who is now deceased uh, named Gale wrote on this extensively in her later life. Um, Laffrey has spent a considerable amount of time studying Lewis and the, and the death thereof. As I said, there were hearings done. Um, there was a coroner's hearing that took place in Tennessee. Um, all of the evidence was being presented by this guy, James Stars, this professor from D.C. That you can find in the book by Laffrey. Um... But it's going to take a while. That The book's a few hundred pages. And he writes the book as a narrative of his life. So you can see it's basically a, a portrait of a guy who was in the same situation as all of us were at one point in time when we didn't really have much of an understanding of how things worked. Um, I would have to say that the 
foundations that were established in the early 20th century with the secret purpose of de-educating and dumbing down Americans uh, through public education. They've done their job really well, and that's why all of us were at that point that he is at at the beginning of the book. Uh, a good chunk of this book has to do with a relationship which he uh, describes as shameful, which I agree. Um, there's a number of conclusions he comes to or things he asserts in the book I agree with. However, we fundamentally disagree on the matter of the veracity of the Bible and Christianity in general. Um, unfortunately, like many others who uh, dismiss biblical veracity, the claims of biblical veracity outright, have not really spent a very large, sincere amount of time therein. Um, they don't tend to heavily articulate their disdain. And uh, another uh, character that exemplifies that sort of mentality uh, would be Jan Lamprecht and his uh, sort of partner in their endeavors called Team White, Alex Linder, a particularly repugnant personality, I might add. Um, this is endemic of, of folks that take that position. Um, and because of that, I, I, I simply can't find myself running parallel to them whatsoever. Unfortunately, yeah, they've come to understand some certain truths about the way things are and they all being quote-unquote white, um, having a certain distinct racial profile, <clears throat> have adopted <clears throat> certain points of view. Um, unfortunately, they're just not taking the next step um, in applying that <clears throat> to the biblical historical narrative, which is the, the very reason that we would be at such odds. So I'm skipping down about a page or two from Schrag's account in The Suppressed History of America. Okay, Lewis is, is dead multiple stab wounds, two gunshot wounds from high-caliber uh, ball pistol or rifle. These are huge, huge projectiles these things are shooting, over a half-inch diameter, and ruled as a suicide. And there are multiple suspicious characters. A guy named Wilkinson, who was the acting governor of the Louisiana Territory before... Lewis, a guy by the name of John Smith T., an associate of Wilkinson, and in the lead mine uh, activity of uh, Missouri, um, Neely, his traveling companion, who said he stayed behind to find some lost horses, uh, Russell, the commander of the fort where he had stopped. The character list goes on and on. The Griners, uh, a half Indian guy, which you can read about a little bit, a little bit, uh, in Laffrey's book. And I don't want to get into all that because it's, it really is a nightmare. And the simple, uh, the simple end to all of this would have been the National Parks Department just okaying the exhumation as it was um, planned uh, by James Stars. I mean, they had they had everything thought out. 
how they would get to the casket, which is said to be directly under the monument, very heavy monuments. It's all stones, marble, and so on. Um, how they would tunnel to it, support it, do all of the tests and examination on site there if they had to. You know, they, they came up with a plan where they literally wouldn't even have to take the casket and body out from under that. And as is characteristics uh, of the National Parks Department, no, 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 no. And immediately afterwards, they begin doing all kinds of work at the site of the Lewis Monument at the, and at the site of where they say the Griner Inn was. Very weird. Very, very weird. Um, so anyways, at archive.org, you can find this book, White Honor, um, by James Laffrey, L-A-F-F-R-E-Y. So, <clears throat> one of the historians that had written on this was a guy by the name of uh, Chuinard. It's, it's a U-I is the diphthong, so I don't know if that's Chuinard or what. C-H-U-I-N-A-R-D. He says that in letters written around this time that Lewis didn't at all seem desperate or depressed, but seemed very lucid. Um, he had expressed that he was going to take a trip to Washington, D.C. and be back in St. Louis by December or so that year. Um, and the case that Stars made in 96, which you can read about in the Laffrey book, um, Everything speaks against this idea that he was suicidal, depressed, uh, the syphilis thing. It, all of it seems like total speculation. And there is more than an adequate case, since this seems to be one of the great mysteries of American history, to either fully exhume the body and put the whole thing to rest, or simply allow that the tunneling operation where you can get a few experts down there who can do tests on the remains. Um, in fact, when they built the monument uh, some years after he was buried in Tennessee, they examined the body briefly at that time and basically reconfirmed uh, this idea that it would have really had to have been murder. Suicide is just ridiculous. So there's this whole cast of, of suspicious characters, and it's really hard to say with all of the propaganda that's out there too, um, just what happened. So uh, I'll pick up, I suppose, uh, with Schrag on page 131. Where he says, further details of Lewis's demise appeared in a letter from Alexander Wilson to a mutual friend. Wilson was a well-known ornithologist and friend of Lewis and had agreed to complete the bird illustrations for Lewis's published journals. Two years after Lewis's body was discovered, while traveling the Natchez Trace, Wilson interviewed Mrs. Griner. He recounted the conversation in a letter to Alexander Lawson, dated May 28, 1811. It reads, Next morning, Sunday, I rode six miles to a man's of the name of Griner, where our poor friend Lewis perished. In the same room where he expired, I took down from Mrs. Griner, the particulars of that melancholy event, which affected me extremely. This house, or cabin, is 72 miles from Nashville, and is the last white man's as you enter the Indian country. Governor Lewis, she said, came there about sunset, alone, and inquired if he could stay for the night. and. A light, uh, alighting brought his saddle into the house. 
He was dressed in a loose gown, white, striped with blue. On being asked if he came alone, he replied that there were two servants behind who would soon be up. He called for some spirits and drank very little. When the servants arrived, one of whom was a negro, he inquired for his powder, saying he was sure he had some powder in a canister. The servant gave no distinct reply, and Lewis, in the meanwhile, walked backwards and forwards before the door, talking to himself. Sometimes she said he would seem as if he were walking up to her, and would suddenly wheel around and walk back as fast as he could. Supper being ready, he sat down, but had not eat but a few mouthfuls when he started up speaking to himself in a violent manner. At these times, she says, he observed his face to flush as if it had come on him in a fit. He lighted his pipe, and drawing a chair to the door sat down, saying to Mrs. Griner in a kind tone of voice, Madam, this is a very pleasant evening. He smoked for some time, but quitted his seat and traversed the yard as before. He again sat down to his pipe, seemed again composed and casting his eyes wishfully towards the west, observed what a sweet evening it was. Mrs. Griner was preparing a bed for him, but he said he would sleep on the floor, and desired the servant to bring the bear skins and buffalo robe, which were immediately spread out for him, and it being now dusk, the woman went off to the kitchen and the two men to the barn, which stands about two hundred yards off. The kitchen is only a few paces from the room where Lewis was, and the woman, being considerably alarmed by the behavior of her guest, could not sleep, but listened to him walking backwards and forwards, she thinks for several hours, and talking aloud, as she said, quote, like a lawyer. She then heard the report of a pistol, and something fall heavily on the floor, and the words, O oh Lord! Immediately afterwards she heard another pistol, and in a few minutes she heard him at her door calling out, O oh, madam, give me some water and heal my wounds. The logs being open and unplastered, she saw him stagger back and fall against a stump that stands between the kitchen and room. He crawled for some distance raised himself by the side of a tree, where he sat about a minute. He once more got to the room. Afterwards he came to the kitchen door, but did not speak. She then heard him scraping the bucket with a gourd for water, but it appears that this cooling element was denied the dying man. As soon as day broke, and not before, the terror of the woman having permitted him to remain for two hours in the most deplorable situation, she sent two of her children to the barn, her husband not being home, to bring the servants, and on going in they found him lying on the bed. He uncovered his side and showed them she, well, he uncovered his side and showed them where the bullet had entered, a piece of the forehead was blown off and had exposed the brains without having bled much. He begged they would take his rifle and blow out his brains, and he would give them all money he had in his trunk. He often said, quote, I am no coward but I am so strong, so hard to die." Unquote. He begged the servant, John Pernier, not to be afraid of him, for that he would not hurt him. He expired about 
two hours or just as the sun rose above the trees. He lies buried close by the common path with a few loose rails thrown over his grave. I gave Griner money to put a post fence round it to shelter it from the hogs and from the wolves and he gave me his written promise he would do it. I left this place in a very melancholy mood, which was not much allayed by the prospect of the gloomy and savage wilderness which I was just entering alone. <sighs> Biographer and editor of one of the earliest accounts of Lewis's adventures, Dr. Elliot Coues, C-O-U-E-S, describes the account given by Wilson of Lewis's death as the one likely to be most accurate. He explains that because of Wilson's scientific training and expertise as a researcher, the accuracy of his account should be considered highly, despite the amount of time that lapsed between Lewis's death and the report. What he doubts, however, is the story provided by Mrs. Greiner which he characterizes as preposterous at best. And I agree. He also questions strongly the final memoir written by Jefferson. In fact, Coase was so certain that the claim of suicide was bogus, he wrote his own supplement to Jefferson's memoir of Lewis. He writes... Jefferson's memoir of Lewis is a noble and fitting tribute, leaving little to be desired as a contemporaneous biography. It has been accepted as an authoritative and final, and has furnished the basis of every memoir of Lewis I've ever seen. What else I have to say concerns not Lewis's life, but the circumstances of his death and certain subsequent events. The affirmation of suicide, though made without qualifications, has not passed unchallenged into history. Undoubtedly, Jefferson wrote in the light of all evidence that had reached him until 1813. But when it appears that his view of the case was far from that of persons who lived in the vicinity of the scene at the time, there is no more room to doubt Wilson's painstaking correctness than there is reasons for doubting his veracity. But the narrative of Miss Griner is very extraordinary. A woman who could do as she said she did, after hearing and seeing what she testifies, must be judged, quote, fit for treason, stratagem, and spoils, unquote, and not to be believed under oath. The story is wildly improbable on its face and does not hang together. There is every sign it is a concoction on the part of an accomplice in crime, either before or after the event. On the theory that Mrs. Griner was privy to a plot to murder Governor Lewis and therefore had her own part to play in the tragedy, even if that part were a passive one or on the theory that, becoming afterward cognizant of the murder, she told a story to shield the actual criminal or criminals. On either of these theories, we could understand Mrs. Griner. Otherwise, her story is simply incredible. Yet, it is upon such evidence as this that the imputation of suicide rests. Now, <clears throat> At this point, I am not going to continue Schrag's narrative simply because it, it doesn't offer any closure. Anybody could read what material there is available on Lewis. The writings of contemporaries at the time or since and you can come to your own conclusions. I mean, the conclusions I simply came to was that it's absurd to believe that it was a suicide, um, and that um, the National Parks Department uh, does not nor has ever existed to serve the people of the United States. 
nor, in my opinion, has it ever existed to purely preserve history, artifacts, architecture, nature, or anything of the sort. So, as a segue, I do want to point this out. I think that out of uh, all of those who have researched these things, and, and this, I really do think that, that this is kind of part of what the problem is with getting to an understanding of American history, for one, and world history as well. It seems like almost without fail, most of the researchers who tend to idolize Meriwether Lewis, uh, they also tend to idolize Jefferson, or if not idolizing, at least tend to put them on <clears throat> a, a different level than the folks around them. And I think, that's, I think that's a terrible mistake. I think it clouds their judgment. And I think that's one of the reasons that more progress has not been made in understanding the life and events and death of Lewis or of Jefferson. Um, more and more people that are objectively looking into history are starting to understand the nefarious character of guys like George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, James Madison, and so on. However, they keep, at least for now, skipping over all of the problems in the lives, the families of, and associations of both Meriwether Lewis and Thomas Jefferson. And I think that's a great mistake that until it's remedied, historians and avid researchers are probably going to be continuing to come to the same relatively erroneous conclusions and not getting closer to the heart of the matters, which will help to explain both American history and world history since America has been for at least a few centuries, <clears throat> excuse me, sort of the, the heart of what is going on in the world. You know, Jefferson had to know because of what happened in his life and the way he really died with nothing and all of his property had to be uh, liquidated because of all of his great debts. Jefferson knew good and well what was going on and who was behind it all. If he was intel as intelligent as he is reported to be, he knew. By the way, he's also a lawyer. And, you know, folks, they weren't much different then than they are now. Um, <laughs> that statement is to not necessarily demonize every lawyer, but it is the system that they, whether they consciously do or not, serve. Jefferson on his memorial, his tomb, he wanted to be remembered for three things that he did. 
One was authoring the Declaration of Independence, which, of course, so many people interpret that there was nothing egalitarian about his statements. You see, egalitarianism has led to a great many problems in the United States and the world today. But in order to maintain their idolatry of Jefferson, they have to interpret his words as being different than what they appear to be saying on their surface. That was Act 1. Act 3 was his founding <clears throat> of the university in Virginia. Now, the second was his writing of an act in Virginia that basically lawfully was a lawful allowance for freedom of religion. Now, many people might look at something like that and say that that was a good thing. However, I strongly disagree. Now, I certainly don't want to live in a state where there is, say, let's just say a state wherein the Catholic Church has full power over the belief and practice of every soul in that state. Um, as you could see, somebody like E. Michael Jones would, would very much like that to be the case. The problem is, there is, besides the, the problems right on the surface, with Catholicism and the Bible, and anyone, including a German monk 500 years ago, could make a very good case as to the problems between the teachings of, the enforced canon laws of the Catholic Church, or the Orthodox Church, or any church and the Bible, because there's too much about it, the Bible, that can be argued about. There is serious problems with the language and the way that we understand it, both of the Old Testament and of the New Testament. And if you have one monolith that presides over an entire society and says there will be no further interpretation other than what we allow, or what we say. That is a problem. Now, there is another faction in our own day who is working very hard to install those same kinds of hegemonic control over how we uh, perceive and interpret, understand and practice the Bible. And a lot of people then would look at something like that and say, well, that's a very good thing. And what he's mostly saying is, here's the problem. He's not saying that. That's not what he is, is trying to secure, is the freedom to, say, disagree with the Pope, or the freedom to, say, disagree with whoever the Lord Governor of a territory or state would be, who would want to impose, uh, you know, their strict regime of religious points of view. And should you disagree or dissent, you could be facing a great amount of trouble. That's not what he was doing. He was opening a door to anyone who believed anything to hold public office. And the problem with that is, and you remember, Jefferson is a guy who said, basically, I'm going to paraphrase, his statement was, 
what does it matter if my neighbor believes in 100 gods or no god? It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg, which is absurd to say. Because if your neighbor believes in the torture god, Oki, at some point, you might find that you're in a worse position than having your pocket picked or your leg broken. It's absurd. And this law he authored, which it said he revised, um, but I think enough of the text was his to have claimed authorship of it. And you remember, that's one of the big three that he wanted to be remembered for. It basically opened the door for anyone with any other god to hold political office. And as we've seen in the last 200 years, that has not worked out well. Because this country has not ascended. It has not improved since. It has gotten worse. And that, the fact that nobody's spiritual belief can be held as any sort of factor in their obtaining of office is a horrific thing. It is a terrible thing. Now, everybody might have different beliefs on that, but I will tell you this. If you are somebody who claims to believe in the Bible, then at the same time, you can't believe that these ideas of freedom of religion are a good thing. In anything past one monolith, as I just said, um, holding sway over a land and a people, wherein you cannot express dissent or different opinion concerning the tenets of the Bible and its practice, that's one thing. That's not what he was doing. He was not talking about that. He was talking about any God, any practice, any belief somebody may have should not bar them from public office in a country that, from everything we've been told, is supposed to be Christian. The two don't harmonize. So I don't view him as a friend of the people or liberty. His Jefferson Bible and the statements that he's made about it, obviously he was not a Christian and he had contempt for it. And maybe that's why some people who are atheists or have contempt for the Bible idolize him. But you know, he knew who the enemy of humanity was in his day. And with all the things he said and is remembered for in all his writings, I have not yet seen one statement denouncing them. Now, some people would say, well, look at all the good he did, like how he repealed the, um, the whiskey tax, uh, how he didn't renew the charter of the First Bank of the United States. Yes, but the thing is, he, he appointed a secretary of the Treasury after Hamilton, who he knew he, he knew would reinstate that bank. And, and it's said by many people that he and Madison were friends. And there's enough, but, um, there's enough to look at in his life. To where I think anybody judging the situation would also agree that it didn't seem that he and Madison were enemies at all. And you're going to start to see why these things matter. The Secretary of Treasury he appointed. Look into who that was. There's even a photograph of him. Look at that photograph of him. And you tell me what he looks like to you. Consider what Laffrey has to say about Madison. And I'm going to try to actually get to that right now. He says on page 216 of his book, 
Um, and this is in relation to the Constitutional Convention, which he has a lot to say about that I think is very appropriate to understanding the history of the United States and the presumed rule of law, which is why I said I, I really had hoped to, to read the document by Spooner, which I think would only take a couple of videos. Um, because again, it, we shouldn't necessarily separate, um, history from geography, from, um, law, economy, because it's all tied together. History is very complicated, but there are ways to simplify it, I believe, without sacrificing facts or simple core rudimentary truths. He says, I'll just start at the front of the paragraph. In March 1808, Meriwether was, fin uh, was finally able to assume his governor's position in St. Louis. Within a year, Jefferson's second term came to an end, and the new president was none other than Constitution co-ringleader James Madison Jr., very likely a crypto-Jew in Jim's estimation given his physical features, actions, and fluency in the Hebrew language of the Jews. During Meriwether's governorship under the new president, Madison's administrators denied repayment to Meriwether of various expenses the governor had judged necessary, such as the printing of territorial laws, all of which the hero had paid for out of his personal funds. Um, this is why I said, if you just... I've done this myself, too, you know, and not just over people, but ideas. For all the criticism I get, Keep something in mind that although I once used to consider the various doctrines, theological ideas, and concepts I had once been taught as fact, unquestionable fact, I don't do that anymore. I look all of the problems that there appear to be in scripture with a very objective eye. Um, I can talk very calmly and confidently about these issues. However, if I were to ignore them, like I think so many people ignore some glaring problems, with both Meriwether Lewis and Thomas Jefferson, I think they're just doomed to coming to bad conclusions, or at least incomplete conclusions. All right, so having said that, I really do want to just read the, the last parts, I think it's going to have to involve some chapters mm. of Laffrey's book. I think they're really well done. I don't agree with every point in the last couple of chapters. Most of it, certainly. Um, of Laffrey's book here. Um, and I'm trying to see where I can pick up without too much redundancy, uh, maybe on my part. The thing is, <clears throat> what happens is, 
as his narrative goes on, he moves from Nashville. Um, and ends up going to grad school um, because he just decided that he wasn't going to be returning to journalism. Goes to grad school, starts picking up on some things, um, but doesn't really uh, start coming to his senses until he goes abroad to teach. Spends time in Japan, spends time in Vietnam, and what he starts understanding from spending times in, in, in those other cultures with those other people is the egalitarian concepts that he's been programmed with since childhood are not true. They're not true, not correct. And he has to come, you know, to a number of realizations. Um, you well, know, Maybe I can just pick up at his chapter entitled Meriwether Lewis and the Jews. Uh, and again, uh, he's coming from a point of view that's, that's very much on the side of Meriwether Lewis as, as a great white hero and Thomas Jefferson as well. And as I said to you, um, I have issues with both of those um, notions. Um, for instance, I had mentioned in, in a comment to a subscriber that it was very strange, uh, not only the fact that, you know, Lewis was inducted as a Mason and within 30 days was made a Master Mason, not as fast as Joseph Smith made one in 24 hours from being officially inducted into the local lodge near Nauvoo, but still, within 30 days, now his father granted 33,033 acres of land from the King of England. Now that is not a coincidence. Um, this probably will lead from here to one other part, and it is very... It, I hate to use the word segues because that's not really a word. It is very transitional from what we were talking about concerning the items hidden um, in America's geography um, and character in history to this. But it is extremely appropriate, which is why uh, I am going to be using it in uh, a transitional way. So here goes. Now, as I said, he begins with the Lewis controversy, but moves forward from there, transitions into a lot of other interesting things. He writes, The first place to start was the treason of Aaron Burr, who had been the vice president during President Thomas Jefferson's first term, 1801 to 1805. <clears throat> the great founding father had not chosen Burr as vice president. The flawed election system at the time put the two, the top two vote getters in office, thus inflicting number two Burr upon Jefferson's administration. Meriwether Lewis's service as the president's private secretary was from 1801 to 1803, thus overlapping with the pres presence of Burr for two years. Meriwether Lewis, a friend of the Jefferson family, had been in the army for a decade before Jefferson took office and invited him to be his private secretary in the White House. Um, as an aside, <clears throat> I don't know if I mention this or not, but Schrag mentions that while in the military for those ten years, it is said that Lewis was court-martialed five times and was exonerated five, five times. I mean, that's in itself is worth some uh, closer examination. He continues, Together they planned the Dream Expedition. Upon Jefferson's brilliant purchase of the Louisiana Territory, the president sent Meriwether in 1803 to learn 
vital skills, such as determining latitude and longitude at any position on Earth, to prepare equipment for the expedition and to appoint the men to serve under his leadership. The Corps of Discovery embarked from St. Louis in 1804, and their triumphant return was in September 1806. For Jim, one of the most intriguing and satisfying events during the time of the expedition, but not part of the expedition, was the famous duel between traitor Aaron Burr and traitor Andrew Hamilton resulting in the deserved death of Hamilton. The only better outcome imaginable for the journalist was if the duel, when he says the journalist, he's speaking of himself, was if the duel's shots had resulted in duel deaths. Crypto Jew Hamilton had been President Washington's Secretary of the Treasury. His vile anti-American financial deeds had been opposed by Jefferson and later partly undone by President Jefferson. Now, keep in mind, the man that Jefferson appointed to Secretary of the Treasury was a very nefarious character himself who got America back into the Second Bank of America. You, you can't put all of that on Madison's shoulders. In the fall of 1806, as national hero, Meriwether Lewis returned to the East and to the capital. He was informed of the tremendous commotion across the country because of Aaron Burr's plots, including Burr's ultimate intention to invade Mexico and make himself king. Now, me personally, this is me talking here, I don't know what that has to do with America. If he had, okay, didn't the Texans do that? You know, forgive my ignorance here, but if he had plans on invading a foreign territory and conquering a portion of it, how is that different than what the Texans did? or what America did when expanding west of the Louisiana Territory. What's the difference? How does that make him a traitor, per se? i also like to point out, it would seem that if one can understand that Burr and um, Hamilton if if some if one views them as both bad guys then what you can see is factions and if you can see that i would hope that one could also apply that to the possibility that you know lewis and jefferson might not have been wearing the white hats while everyone else the black hats um unfortunately to me as as I look at, at all of this and don't have the time to really look very, very deep into these matters as of yet, uh, I'm seeing most of them just wearing various shades of gray hats. Um, anyways, continuing. Um... President Jefferson had issued a nationwide order for the arrest of Burr. Meanwhile, Burr was fleeing down the Mississippi with the intention of getting into a British naval ship and presumed safety at Pensacola, Florida. However, en route, Burr was detected and arrested in February 1807, later taken to Richmond, Virginia, and locked up there until his treason trial held through August, September, and October 1807. Thus, despite Meriwether's eagerness to pursue post-expedition responsibilities, such as the extensive preparations necessary before professionally produced journals and scientific results could be published, he was delayed by, among other matters, the dominant political crisis of the time, which was the Burr Conspiracy. Meanwhile, in March, which was after Burr's arrest and prior to the trial, Jefferson appointed Meriwether to be the new governor of the Louisiana Territory, 
displacing General James Wilkinson from that post. Wilkinson, who had been concurrently the head of the U.S. Army and governor of the Louisiana Territory, was known to have cooperated with Burr and to have turned St. Louis into a hornet's nest of corruption. <laughs> um, boy. Yeah. I, you know, anyone who was the actual head of the Western Army of the U.S. during these times, from the 1700s, which the ar there was an army far before there was a constitution. There were Articles of Confederation far before a constitution, and may have been an army far before that. However, anyone who was at the head of the American army on the Western Front around this time, um, I would never for a moment consider them to be on the up and up as far as honesty or integrity goes. Like, I, I just can't understand why anyone would think anything different. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, he continues, Job one for the new governor in St. Louis would be to root out the Burrites, as Meriwether described them. That job first fell upon the Secretary of the Louisiana Territory, Frederick Bates, who actually had quite a career uh, after this, who became the acting governor upon Wilkinson's military reassignment southward against the Spanish. Bates would have to wait a year for Meriwether's arrival to the governor's chair. Despite the huge load of the post-expedition duties, family matters, and other personal responsibilities that Meriwether had to pursue, everything was delayed. Meriwether had always been an asset to President Jefferson, and it was certain that the president pressed the great 33-year-old into service during the pre-trial and trial activities against the former vice president and his network of treason. Jim already had read the online transcription of the treason trial of Burr. The journalist had recognized the judge's actions as at least worthy of impeachment and likely deserving of his own trial and execution for treason. The worst crime by the judge, who was Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall, a longtime political opponent of Thomas, Thomas Jefferson, was his limiting of the court's definition of treason as to make a verdict of treason impossible. Thus, as intended, Burr got off. President Jefferson's reaction was reported as furious. The president wrote, quote, We supposed we possessed fixed laws to guard us equally against treason and oppression. But it now appears we have no law but the will of a judge. Likewise furious in Jim's estimation was Meriwether's reaction, and certainly so was Jim's. As the text of the testimony from the witnesses laid bare to him a network of treason, General Wilkinson was another suspect. Sub subsequently, the general was proved as a co-conspirator with Burr. But the ever-crafty Wilkinson had saved himself in late 1806 by betraying Burr directly to Jefferson, thus apparently duping Jefferson into thinking Wilkinson a patriot. If not duped, how else could it be explained? The journalist thought, that Jefferson continued to allow Wilkinson to head the army. A barrage of letters from respectable citizens of St. Louis had informed the president of Wilkinson's network of corruption involving illegal land schemes, collusion in the lucrative and vital mining operations of lead and other resources and key governmental posts. Indeed, as Jim learned, that Western network extended from Nashville to St. Louis to New Orleans. Among these men were heinous traitors and murderers. And uh, me personally, I have not gotten 
to find out what great value the western counties of St. Louis had, per se, um, though they are along sort of the crook of the Missouri River um, as it um, comes from the north and then heads eastward to the Mississippi, near Kansas City, Missouri. Um, there is something about that land there, sort of a tri-county area, and specifically independence. And that's the reason that Joseph Smith had a so-called revelation about heading that way. And you'd, you'd just be astounded at how many Mormons there were filling up that area as early as 1833, only a few years after the so-called revelation of Smith or the translation of the Golden Plates by Smith. And, of course, that's all a different story. However, um, as I said, unification, all of this has certain veins that run through it that should help us to understand. And what Laffrey is talking about here is just simply one vein that helps us understand what's going on. It's a big vein, though. If you remove it from history, you're not going to understand history nor the present world. So he continues, thanks to the evidence presented by Professor Starr's eminent team at the coroner's inquest in Hohenwald. Uh, that's in the place in Tennessee where Lewis was buried and they had the coroner's inquest. Uh, combined with the evidence culled from the journals of Lewis and Clark as edited by Gary Moulton, plus the evidence from the journalist's other research, and with recent facts exposed and published by Kira Gale, Thomas Danisi, and others, the fog was lifted to reveal various henchmen and accomplices of the western branch of the network of treason. But which ones were Jews? That was the most important question, and the journalist knew of no researcher but himself asking it. Another silent question was whence the funding came for Burr's major expenses. So far, Jim had found no reports on that. Yep, always follow the money. The head of the Western branch of treason was surely General James Wilkinson, as the investigative journalist learned. Wilkinson was later proved by documentation from Spain that he had been a paid secret agent for the government of Spain since 1787. <laughs> the year of what Jim called the Con, capital C-O-N, Convention, of treason in Philadelphia. Wilkinson was later shown to have had destroyed the career of the military hero George Rogers Clark, older brother of Meriwether Lewis's friend William Clark. Wilkinson accomplished that crime by a deceitful campaign of falsified letters, which was a tactic later seen again in the lies about Meriwether Lewis and his death. Lying letters came from men under Wilkinson's command. Captain James House, Captain Gilbert Russell, and Major James Neely. In 1796, Wilkinson was given the commanding general position of the U.S. Army when Commanding General Anthony Wayne died of a suspicious case of what he called stomach gout. In 1803, despite whatever evidence and hearsay Jefferson may have received, the president appointed Wilkinson to the governorship of the Louisiana Territory. The disappointing leniency would repeat in 1807, when after receiving many reports of Wilkinson's crimes as governor in St. Louis, Jefferson replaced him with Meriwether Lewis and sent Wilkinson on a military mission to stop the Spanish west of New Orleans. Thus, Wilkinson in 1807 was still in a position of power to further his ongoing plans of treason with Burr. 
I've looked at a number of the appointments of Jefferson, and um, they are pretty hard to explain, as far as I'm concerned. Why not replace Wilkinson? In my estimation, there were a number of men who you could have replaced Wilkinson with. I suppose one of the excuses would be that Jefferson had to play the game, right? These are the same excuses that are being made for Donald Trump today. You can't turn on either Radio Arian or Eurofolk Radio without hearing a number of people making excuses like that about Trump, about Putin, <laughs> about Tommy Robinson, Sven Longshanks. I can't even count anymore the amount of times that he has said very positive things about Zionist Tommy Robinson. So this idea they have to play the game, well, I don't know. I just don't know about that, you know? It always, to me, sounds like an excuse, this whole 4D chess idea. Is that what Jefferson was doing? with all of these appointments of, in my estimation, rotten folks. Was he playing 4D chess? He continues, the journalists also learned that Captain James House had been one of the first, if not the first, to send a letter claiming that Meriwether Lewis was in a state of mental derangement. This had been mailed from Fort Pickering, where House conveniently was spending some furlough time as Meriwether Lewis arrived there en route to Washington, D.C. The House letter went to Frederick Bates, the Territory Secretary in St. Louis, who himself despised Meriwether Lewis. After Meriwether's death, Major James Neely repeated the embellishment that, quote, mental derangement, unquote, claim. Neely had been appointed by Wilkinson as the local U.S. agent to the Chickasaw tribe, and it was an implausible story from the assassination site in Tennessee that set the main course for the cover-up. Several weeks later, and again years later, Captain Gilbert Russell of Fort Pickering also repeated and further embellished that derangement claim by House and Neely. All of these men Jim found were in key physical and governmental positions in the final weeks, days, and hours before Meriwether was assassinated. The leader they all had in common was the vile but charismatic traitor, spy, career wrecker, corrupt administrator Wilkinson. Thus, they were accomplices in Wilkinson's western branch of treason. While in St. Louis, Wilkinson had appointed to government positions a murderous, power-hungry, multi-weaponed bully named John Smith T. The T appendage meant Tennessee, and was attached by Smith to distinguish himself from all other John Smiths. I'll tell you what, though, folks. In scanning through all kinds of reports and documents on American history, there are a really large amount of shady characters with the name Smith. <laughs> if your name is Smith, this is obviously not attacking everybody named Smith. Uh, however, I have to wonder if some of these shady characters from this early time weren't related in some way. Um, or just a coincidence. I mean, Smith is not nearly as odd a name as many others. But then again, neither is Lewis, nor Jefferson, nor Bates. I digress. Smith T. had built a record of obeying no laws but his own, which he enforced as he went along by the one rifle, 
two pistols and two dirks he reportedly always carried. Wilkinson, his territory secretary Joseph Brown with an E, and Smith T, engaged together in corruptions and crimes involving their offices, lands, and mines. Thus, Brown and Smith T were two more members of the network of treason. Wilkinson's co-conspiracy with Burr made it a countrywide network of treason. In March 1808, Meriwether was finally able to assume his governor's position in St. Louis. Within a year, Jefferson's second term came to an end, and the new president was none other than Con, capital C-O-N, Constitution, co-ringleader James Madison, Jr. The reason for the capitals and the con he's putting in there is from the Constitutional Convention, which he will talk about later and why it was such a travesty. It's very, it, he says, James Madison Jr., very likely a crypto Jew in Jim's estimation, given his physical features, actions, and fluency in the Hebrew language of the Jews. During Meriwether's governorship under the new president, Madison's administrators denied repayment to Meriwether of various expenses the governor had judged necessary such as the printing of territorial laws, all of which the hero had paid for out of his personal funds. Compounding that crisis was an obvious problem with the mail, which Meriwether diplomatically described as delay and loss of letters. The prime suspect, according to at least one modern researcher, was postmaster John Hay in Cahokia, Illinois. The mail from St. Louis bound eastward crossed the Mississippi and first stopped in the hay shop. Another researcher, as Jim Red, showed that Meriwether's letters suffered delays of weeks and months up to six months, as compared with other government officials' letters to the, con oh, to the country's capital during that same time period. William Clark's letters from St. Louis also showed delays though far less than Meriwether's. The letters by Frederick Bates sent east showed no similar delays. Thus, Hay appeared to Jim as very likely another member of the Western Network of Treason. A further clue about Postmaster Hay was that his father, Yehu, or John Hay, or maybe his name was Yehu John Hay, born a Brit in early Pennsylvania, was second in command at Fort Sackville when hero George Rogers Clark's forces defeated Hay and cronies during the American Revolution. Yehu Hay was imprisoned, then released in a prisoner exchange with England and after a short stay in England, he was appointed lieutenant governor of the Brits post in Detroit. So he returned and became, for a brief time, a wealthy, corrupt official in Detroit, Michigan, until he died in 1785, when son John was 15 years old. A chip off the old block, John was pro-Brit, anti-American, throughout his life. For example, John Hay refused to help the USA in the War of 1812. Three years after the murder of the great American man to whom Hay had pretended to be a friend, Meriwether Lewis. For journalist Jim, every name known to be popular among Jews threw up a red flag, as did odd names such as Yehu Hay. Typically, his web searches quickly turned up clues, especially in close relatives, names, places of birth, and jobs held. But frustratingly, the thin clues usually did not stack up to a sufficient weight for conclusions. The question of Junus was both vital and very difficult to answer. But without that answer, everyone insufficiently wise to Jewry would assume that the race of the criminals 
and those who had enabled and re-enabled them was white. In the case of Yehu John Hay, the use of the common John instead of his real name looked to have been an obvious deceit commonly used by the Jews. So Yehu, the father of John Hay, went by the name John, but his name was actually Yehu, J-E-H-U, Yehu, Hay. <clears throat> Yehu, as the journalist found, was a lofty name in Jew history, meaning the Lord is He, or Jehovah is He, and notably the name of a king of the Jews <laughs> in the 800s B.C., while well, the king of the Judahites, remember Jews, is not even inserted until Second Chronicles 16. The fact added significant, and by the way, that this term being inserted into the Bible was something that was accomplished more recently than long, long ago. And Jews did not even start referring to themselves as Hebrews or Israelites until really the last few centuries. Before that, they didn't have the gall to do such a thing. This is one of the problems that me and Laffrey would have is like Jan Lamprecht, like Alex Linder, he likes to assert that the Bible is Jewish propaganda, which all one would have to do is carefully read it to realize that that's anything but the case. I will continue. This fact added significant weight to the clues that Yehu He was a Jew, thus allowing a conclusion. Since Yehu He was a Jew, his son John the dishonest postmaster was a Jew too. Or he wasn't and he was just dishonest. <laughs> um, there are plenty of people in every race there is that are dishonest, that are willing for, you know, 30 pieces of silver or sometimes less to sell out their own people. Um, and, you know, that's not to take away from the hegemonic tribal conspiracy that has gone on for a long time. That is documentable. That is factual. The problem is, is that, you know, even myself, I did this. When coming to the understanding of the war that is being waged on us, <clears throat> and depending on what your race may be, you might have a different perspective on the war that's been waged on your people. Um, however, I find it to be a mistake to, in the same way that maybe some who have preconceived notions about Lewis and Jefferson would put them on a pedestal and refuse to see factual information about them. Well, the same thing happened to me for some time when I understood what was going on and how so much lying propaganda had been uh, produced, propagated, um, and really spread uh, throughout the whole world against the people called whites, Northern Europeans, some Eastern Europeans, not so much Mediterranean Europeans anymore, that it had all been crap, lies. And so the reaction to that is usually, well, first off, if you have a healthy mind, you're going to reacquire um, a love for your own people that these lies had leached out of you pretty much from birth. But what tends to happen is sometimes you don't have, I think, a reasonable amount of 
good objective judgment. Uh, sometimes enough to understand that people of your own race, even though you could see, even properly see, that your own race has accomplished so many wonderful, excellent things. True. However, there are many people amongst your own race who have uh, done a lot of evil things. Y you have to look at these things objectively. You know, all you need to do is read Romans 9 through 11, if you don't believe me. So I find that to be one of the downsides to learning what's going on and to learning if you're, in quotes, white, learning all of the lies that have been spread about you and people like you. Anyways, he continues, For the journalists, there were many more people to investigate, but not uh, th at this time. There was no, or, but there wasn't time, but not the time. There isn't. And he's right. It's very difficult, too, to figure out who's who and who's Jew. Very difficult. Um, and sometimes you have to come to certain conclusions. Um, and those are really tough because you really, you want to get to the heart of what's true. I do. I'm not going to speak for him. Um, you know, I'll let him speak for himself here, but I do. And so, if you don't have the facts, you tend to be very reticent at coming to conclusions that could be unfair. You don't want to do that. Um, however, there has been a very effective campaign to make many people's lineage and race known. So he goes on, there was no doubt in him that Jews had been in place from New York to St. Louis and on to San Francisco as soon as the West Coast city was established. On the web, he had found Jew archives that offered lists and descriptions of their historical documents, but of course no easy access for whites to those documents. The list includes the names, locations, and dates of various Jew congregations across the continent. While he knew that the Jews' claims always had to be viewed skeptically, he found the Jew archival documents a treasure trove for learning many more names commonly used by Jews. One particular archive list dated 1955 reported the possession of books, letters, and other documents including information about historically infamous Jews such as Theodore Herzl, Albert Einstein, Louis Brandeis, Louis Marshall, Jacob Schiff, Bernard Baruch, Franklin Roosevelt, and many more. A mere sampling of documents, all written by Jews, showed the early and continued presence of Jews throughout or across the continent. One, a book, Jews in South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, 16, uh, 1695 through 1950 by Alan Tarshish, which definitely sounds possibly like a Jewish name as well, to a book, The Jews in New Jersey, 1702-1953 by Joshua O. Haberman. And I'm going to be omitting the dates here if I get any more and just give you the author name. Number three, many items from the Quebec Gazette newspaper since 1768, including a letter dated 14 October 1790 in memorial of the Jew merchants of Montreal one of the famous locations of treason by Benedict Arnold. The letter was written to Lord Guy Carleton and signed by David David, Samuel David, 
and Levi Solomon's. For the circumcision book of Congregation Mikveh Israel in Hebrew in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania by Bernard Jacobs. Jim had learned that the Jews had duped many whites by way of religion to adopt the vile Jew practice of circumcision in order to help the enemy Jews hide among the white population. <laughs> this, okay, indeed circumcision was a crime inflicted upon the white race. Now I've heard this, this is me now, I've heard this over and over and over again from people who at once they claim to be the woke whites uh, because they're now they're sharp to the Jewish issue uh, and at the same time claiming that circumcision is some vile practice foisted among whites when you don't seem to understand that first off circumcision was made with Abraham to be kept by all of his descendants now if you understood who his descendants were which are not Jews if you took the time to read the Bible and saw that Abraham's descendants would be a blessing on the world and that kings and many countries nations and people the amount which you could not count like the stars in the heaven or the sand on the seashore you would start to understand that the Jews don't fit to that description and you would stop saying things that are so ignorant now it's very interesting because I've talked to people in medicine <clears throat> about circumcision and how is circumcision as far as a practice concerning cleanliness and ease of keeping from infections diseases and problems down there and what's very interesting is that medical professionals across the board recognize the superior qualities that circumcision has to non circumcision so I don't know about the foisting of it and again the idea or theory that they would <laughs> impose that upon whites so that they may hide amongst whites well here's the thing I don't want to see anybody else's penis in order to determine whether or not <laughs> they're like me uh, in fact that has been traditionally one of the biggest head scratching issues I kind of have with circumcision um, is how often is this going to be an issue um, you know to where you have to you look at somebody else's penis examine their organ in order to to determine this this is something that I'm still kind of not fully sure of of how it works as far as its 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 implication goes um but you know I've heard this is this is actually the uh, the sentiment of 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 the Icelandic people almost as a whole now because you know I've been hearing these stories about them really wanting to push out the Jewish bankers and reject circumcision as being a Jewish thing when it's not a Jewish thing it's an Abrahamic thing you know the Jews can claim Abraham as their ancestor all they want without it being true Abraham's descendants that were promised to be a blessing to the world were the Israelites now just because they named their country that doesn't make it so because they claim to be the descendants of Abraham doesn't make it so 
you have to read the Bible and pay attention to what's going on there, or you're going to confuse things. Now, point five, a compilation of records of births, marriages, and deaths of the family of the Lions with a Y, Lazarus, Levy, Hohenfels, and Marx. Now, guys, remember, the, the man that Meriwether Lewis's mother married after his father died when he was about 10, that man's name was Marx. Anyways. Um, six, the last will and testament of David Lopez, 1797 Boston, Mass., as a copy from the Register of Probate Court, Boston, Massachusetts, Jim noticed the name Lopez, remembering it as one of the common Spanish names used by Jews in early American history. Correct. Especially among the Jew owners and operators of slave ships. Correct. Also, crypto-Jews with Spanish names abounded in Mexico and infiltrated from there into the USA. The archive also contained many letters from the prominent merchants Brown and Company of Providence, Rhode Island. Too many Jews... Yes, Brown is a common Jewish name, all named involved in the slave trade and other businesses from 1759 on through the slave trading era. Every time he came across such documentation, the journalist shook his head in wonderment and disgust at the Jews' audacity and monumental deceit in having made American whites believe that whites had been the anti-human owners and operators of the international slave trade of Africans into America not to mention all of the whites, but that's something that Jim hasn't come across quite yet, I'm assuming. Furthermore, he knew it was a crime against humanity stopped by white people, not stopped by the Jews, and not stopped by the Africans. In the 21st century, some Africans and Asians were still selling their own people into slavery, proving a genetic difference in mentality between them and the white race. They still are. They still are. We just don't hear about it. There are still low-key slave markets in places like Saudi Arabia, Africa, Asia, and so forth. There is still a very burgeoning white slave market where whites are stolen and still sold. They are sold usually to factions in is not real. That's a big place where a lot of light white slaves are shipped. Point seven, an original of the advertisement by Judah M. Isaacs, Newport, Rhode Island, in the Guardian of Liberty newspaper on Saturday, December 6, 1800. Volume 1, number 10. Jew Isaacs informed the public that he, quote, had undertaken the business of a broker in all its various branches, unquote. Oh, by the way, Lopez was also a name of one of the crypto-Jews on Columbus's voyage. A book, The Story of Arkansas Jewry, 1836 through 1593, by Samson A. Shane. A book, The Saga of Congregation Emanuel, San Francisco, California, and 10, a detailed statement, 100 years of Minnesota Jewish history, 1850 through 1953, delivered at the Tercentenary, sorry, Tercentenary Institute, Estes Park, Colorado, June 21st, 1953. That archive had claimed evidence of Jew congregations back to 1695. But another source reported Jews from Spain and Portugal officially founding their congregation, Shirath Israel, in New York in 1655. With the Jews attached there, New York City was to become, as exposed by inventor-publisher Henry Ford, the seat of the Jew government called the Kihila in the USA and a supreme headquarters of international Jewry, as it is to this day. 
The extensive infiltration by Jews into North America since the inception of the African slave trade and on through the American Revolution and the convention's overthrow of the original government of the USA was documented. Historical fact. But for Jim, was uh, what was missing in his findings was conclusive evidence about Jews atop the exposed portion of the network of treason against President Jefferson and Meriwether Lewis. Was Burr a Jew? Was Wilkinson a Jew? For both, he had only their behavior as a clue not weighty enough for conclusions. Further digging by the journalist turned up heavy evidence in the form of a book, A General History of the Burr Family in America, with a general record from 1570 to 1878, written by a member of that family named Charles Burr Todd, and published in 1878. By the way, Abraham Lincoln's wife, her last name was Todd. There, Jim found reported that the first burr in North America was in 1630, a Yehu burr, also spelled Yehu without the E at the end. There it is, the journalist said to himself, the same as the Cahokia postmaster John Hayes, was a Jew, son of Yehu, so Aaron Burr, was a Jew from a long line of Jews infesting America. Okay, hold on. I'm going to interject real quick. The further you go back, the more you will see, in general, biblical names. Christians taking biblical names. You could have Yehu. You might have Ahaz, Ishmael, Hezekiah. To this day, many Amish still have those seemingly antiquated names. Um, one name, Yehu. There's just a few points in some of his conclusions that he comes to that I have to say, you know, I would need more. And I appreciate the fact that him, him saying, well, I had to have their actions and other things. I do. I appreciate that. I understand that. However, what I would have to see is usually um, collusions or associations with certain individuals and institutions that could lead me to believe nothing but that they had to be of a different and adversarial race to whites. Um, some people have um some people have higher standards in their fact finding and some lower um some people are more ready to believe certain things than others just the name yehu probably wouldn't be enough for me he continues, indeed, as he read through the book, the conclusion grew even stronger with names common among Jewry, repeating generation after generation all the way to Aaron. Furthermore, I've known plenty of quote-unquote Gentiles named Aaron. Furthermore, the limited variety of professions fit the historical pattern of Jewry, especially as lawyers, like Thomas Jefferson, in government... <laughs> in governmental positions, in control of money. In addition, the Burrs typically had chosen to intermarry with other families with known Jew names. The Burrs were crypto-Jews. And unfortunately, I can point this out about so many people. I told you, there are many Jews today with the name Lewis. That's why you, you can't just have preconceived notions about these people. I think it's so important to keep your mind open about these things. You know, don't don't just condemn certain people um with prejudice or idolize certain people with prejudice. He says on Wilkinson, I know we're at an hour 40, but I want to get a few things in here before 
I wrap. This particular chapter actually goes on for some time. However, I do want to continue some things from his book because especially here at the end, you do get uh, a lot of information kind of <clears throat> packed in. And as I said, a, a good deal of it's pretty decent. He says, indeed, as he read through the book, the conclusion grew even stronger with names common among Jewry repeating. I already read that. On Wilkinson, beyond the entire adult life of deceit and crime up to and including treason, further evidence came piece by piece. The journalist found most portraits showing a very slanted forehead on Wilkinson. A clue. His mother's name, which the most famous Jew owned sources did not mention, was Betty Height Wilson. The Height intrigued the journalist, knowing that middle names were frequently ancestors' family names. True. Further knowing that Jews had often changed spellings but retained the same or similar pronunciations. Yes, they do. He realized that the Height could be akin to the Jew Hey. Oh, H E I G H E. So I guess that would be pronounced Hey. Okay, I'll go with that. Fine. Hey. Could be akin to the Jew Hey, H A Y. Family, or to the more recent Haig, H A I G, family, which may be pronounced without the G at the end. Searches quickly revealed further clues. Hey, H E A H E I G H E, was indeed a family name as confirmed by information from the Wilkinson book by Patricia Wilkinson. Weaver Baletta, but without access to the book or other strong sources, the hay clue came up light. Weight came from Wilkinson's first wife, Anne Biddle. Jim quickly found that she was a member of the famous Jew Biddle family, which included some infamous anti-American, anti-white criminals. The president of the Second Bank of the United States, an aide to FDR in the creation of the United Nations, a primary judge in the atrocious Nuremberg trials and executions of great German leaders, and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. See, now we're getting somewhere. Thus, Wilkinson had married a Jew. The Wilkinsons named one of their sons Theophilus, which is an odd name found in the Bible written by Jews and was a name used by Jews during their infestation and ruination of Rome. <clears throat> yeah, actually, the Bible was mostly written by Israelites. Some portions by Judahites, I would imagine, although mostly Levites or Luim and other various Israelites, not Jews. It's so unfortunate when people don't take the time to really investigate the Bible, read the story, the narration, what's going on before coming to conclusions. You know, sometimes it's just downright embarrassing. To this weighty pile of clues, Jim added the procession of get out of court Marshall free cards that the first four presidents gave uh, to the traitor Wilkinson. Only one race in America had ever exhibited both the amoral unity and the powerful influence to save their members, proved guilty from prosecutions and executions, as Jim had well learned that race was Jewry. But one question lingered in regard to Wilkinson. If he were a Jew, why did he betray his fellow Jew Burr? Now, Jim continues. I'm going to wrap this up with, he continues by saying that he theorizes that Wilson knew that if Burr were to go to a trial for treason, that <clears throat> fellow Jews would, would uh, get him out of that. Okay. Maybe so. It's a theory. He admits that it's a theory. Um, as I said, there is a, a large portion at the end of this book that's really 
just interesting information, you know, uh, to be thought about. <clears throat> Enough here for a, a separate video. Um, maybe before I go on to the um, Spooner material, which I do hope to go on to. Real, like I said, the Spooner material is only going to be a video or two. So I'm going to cut it off there. I'm at an hour and 45. Um, I'll pick up next time, which is not really going to have as much on, on Wilkinson, Burr, Lewis, because I think we've adequately covered that. Uh, yes, it's a little bit different than the material was in the first four, I think, of Hiding America. But you know something? Hiding the Jewry of America is, as far as I'm concerned, just as detrimental with understanding America as hiding the giants or the white tribes or the original river systems and so on and so forth. So it's important. So I'll pick this up next time. I'll conclude uh, a number of the interesting things that Laffrey has to say at the end of this book. So, till next time, take care, everybody. See you then.